Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, listening today. It is my, my pleasure to be part of this Congress. I'm sorry that we cannot be uh, together in person, but, but I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you about the evaluation and management of hyperinsulinism. The learning objectives for this lecture are to recognize the guidelines for a screening and evaluation of neonates at risk for persistent hypoglycemia, to define the diagnostic criteria for hyperinsulinism, and to discuss the diagnostic approach and to recognize therapeutic treatment options for hyperinsulinism. In 2015, the Pediatric Endocrine Society convened a panel of experts in hypoglycemia to formulate recommendations from the, for the evaluation and management of persistent hypoglycemia in neonates, infants, and children. This was particularly important because up to this point, all previous guidelines had referred to only the first 24 hours of life. So I want to emphasize that the purpose of these guidelines were for neonates that have persistent hypoglycemia beyond these first few hours of life. And it's also important because of difficulties to distinguish between newborns who have a persistent hypoglycemia disorders and those with self-limited transitional hypoglycemia. The guiding principles for these guidelines were to avoid unnecessary investigations in normal newborns and to help physicians recognize persistent hypoglycemia disorders, guide their expeditious diagnosis and effective treatment, and prevent brain damage in at-risk babies. I invite you to visit the Journal of Pediatrics. This article is free for download. I'm not going to cover all aspects of the guidelines, but um, you can have access to it through the journal. The recommendations had three sections. Section one was which neonates, infants, and children to evaluate for hypoglycemia. Section two, the workup investigation of persistent hypoglycemia in neonates, infants, and children. And section three, the management of neonates, infants, and children with a documented persistent hypoglycemia disorder. So who are these neonates that are at high risk for persistent hypoglycemia? We identify four groups of neonates that require further evaluation to rule out a persistent hypoglycemia disorder. The first groups are neonates with severe hypoglycemia. This would include an, a baby that had an episode of symptomatic hypoglycemia, or that had required intravenous dextrose to treat hypoglycemia. The second groups are neonates unable to consistently maintain prepandial plasma glucose concentrations greater than 2.8 millimolar per liter in the first 48 hours of life, or greater than 3.3 millimolar per liter after the, sec the, four the first 48 hours of age. The third group were neonates with a family history of a genetic form of hypoglycemia, for example, the infant of a family with a previous child affected by congenital hyperinsulinism. And the fourth group were neonates with fissures of congenital syndromes known to be associated with hypoglycemia, for example, the neonates with fissures of beckwith wiedemann syndrome or with a normal physical fissure suggested of hypopituitarism. In this group of neonates at high risk for persistent hypoglycemia, the committee recommended evaluation when the infant is greater than 48 hours of age so that the period of transitional glucose regulation has passed and a persistent hypoglycemia disorder may be excluded before discharging the baby home. So, we, the purpose of this evaluation is to diagnose the underlying mechanism of persistent hypoglycemia and the recommendation to do the evaluation after 48 hours of life is to avoid confusion with those babies that have transitional hypoglycemia. This evaluation should be done to obtain a critical sample at the time of hypoglycemia, which would allow to determine the etiology of the persistent hypoglycemia. This critical sample can be obtained either during a, a spontaneous episode of hypoglycemia or at the end of a diagnostic fasting test. The critical sample includes measurements of metabolic fuels, 
hormones and other markers that would allow for the evaluation of the underlying cause of hypoglycemia. In a neonate, we are limited by the amount of blood samples that can be taken at a single time point. So I'm highlighting here the tests that I consider critical to be obtained during that spontaneous episode of hypoglycemia that includes a plasma glucose, a plasma beta hydroxybutyrate, plasma free fatty acid levels, a plasma lactate, an insulin concentration, and bicarbonate. And we use these parameters to determine the underlying cause of the persistent hypoglycemia. If we look at the frequency of the different disorders that cause persistent hypoglycemia in neonates, as you can see in this graph, about three quarters of neonates with persistent hypoglycemia have hyperinsulinism, either one of the congenital forms of hyperinsulinism or transient hyperinsulinism. And then the other quarter includes babies with hypopituitarism, with fatty acid oxidation defects of glycogenosis. So we're going to talk the rest of the time about hyperinsulinism. This is the most common cause of persistent hypoglycemia in neonates, infants, and children. And it's caused by dysregulated insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cells. Hyperinsulinism can be the result of perinatal factors. We're going to talk next about perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism because this is the most common form of hyperinsulinism that we see in the neonatal population. Hyperinsulinism can also be part of a syndrome, and the most frequent syndrome associated with hyperinsulinism is beckwith wiedemann syndrome, but also Kabuki syndrome and Turner syndrome among others. And the last group are those babies with monogenic defects in genes encoding important factors for the regulation of insulin secretion, and they are dominant and recessive forms of congenital hyperinsulinism, and we'll review the most common of them. But first, let's discuss how we establish the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. To establish the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism, we look for evidence of increased insulin secretion or of increased insulin actions. And this include detection of insulin at the time of hypoglycemia, evidence that insulin is suppressing the key fasting mechanisms, including lipolysis, as demonstrated by a low plasma free fatty acid at the time of hypoglycemia, evidence that insulin is suppressing ketogenesis as demonstrated by a low plasma beta hydroxybutyrate or plasma ketones at the time of hypoglycemia, and evidence that insulin is suppressing glycogenolysis as demonstrated by a glycemic response to a pharmacologic dose of glucagon at the time of hypoglycemia. And I like to review this graph because it illustrates the fact that we cannot always rely on a detectable insulin to make the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. As you can see in this graph in red are insulin concentrations according to plasma glucose concentration in neonates with hyperinsulinism compared to controls in the empty circles. As you can see in some neonates with hyperinsulinism, the insulin concentrations are markedly elevated, but in some of them, the plasma insulin concentration is low and it can even be undetectable. So the sensitivity of a detectable insulin at the time of, of hypoglycemia for the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism is only 82.2%. But any detectable insulin is evidence of hyperinsulinism with a specificity of 100%. A test with better sensitivity is the plasma beta hydroxybutyrate. So if the plasma beta hydroxybutyrate or plasma ketones is less than 1.8 millimolar per liter during hypoglycemia, the sensitivity and specificity for hyperinsulinism is 100%. So this is a very useful test for the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. The last test that I want to review is the evaluation of the glycemic response to a pharmacologic dose of glucagon. And please note that we use a large pharmacologic dose to elicit this response. So the recommended dose is one milligram of glucagon intravenously or intramuscularly. And we look at the plasma glucose response within the first 40 minutes. An increase in plasma glucose of greater than 30 milligrams per deciliter has a sensitivity of 
for hyperinsulinism and a specificity of 100%. So just to summarize what I just said, to make the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism, we look for evidence of detectable insulin, evidence that ketones are suppressed and a glycemic response to glucagon. But the lack of detectable insulin during hypoglycemia does not rule out the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. As I said previously, the sensitivity is only 82%. So we're gonna talk now about perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism. And I like to use this picture to illustrate a point. If I ask you, which of these two babies had hyperinsulinism? Most frequently, people are gonna point to the baby on the right, the larger baby, because we associate large birth weight with hyperinsulinism. However, in this case, the baby that has hyperinsulinism is the small baby. And this is um, perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism. The prevalence has been estimated to be as high as 50% in at-risk neonates. We look at a series of over 100 babies at our institution and identify that babies with perinatal stress hyperinsulinism were more frequently male, 75% of our cohort were males, and the perinatal factors associated with perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism in this cohort were prematurity, intrauterine growth retardation or small uh, birth weight for gestational age, a greater than a standard resuscitation required after birth, and maternal preeclampsia in the frequency that you can see on the screen. The proposed mechanism of hyperinsulinism in these babies is that these perinatal stressors particularly probably decrease blood flow to the, through the placenta is associated with impaired beta cell maturation. So that there's a prolongation of the transitional hyperinsulinemic state that is physiologically normal in the first 24 hours of life. The clinical course in these babies can be highly variable. The, the hyperinsulinism can be mild, but it can also be very severe requiring high glucose infusion rates of up to 20, 12 milligrams per kilogram per minute, which was the mean in the cohort that we study. These babies are responsive to treatment with isoxide and the hallmark is the spontaneous resolution of the hyperinsulinism within the first two to three months uh, of life. However, it's important to note that the outcomes in these babies can be as poor as the outcomes of babies with congenital forms of hyperinsulinism. In our series of over 100 babies with perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism, about half of the parents expressed concern about development, 40% of these babies had speech delays, 26% had learning disabilities, and 41% had behavioral issues. I would like now to briefly discuss congenital hyperinsulinism in beckwith wiedemann syndrome. As you know, beckwith wiedemann syndrome results from various genetic and epigenetic anomalies in the imprinted 11P15.5 region, and is characterized by overgrowth, including macroglossia, hemihypertrophy, and also abdominal wall defects as on phallocele or umbilical hernia. About 50% of babies with beckwith wiedemann syndrome have hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. And this severity can be transient and responsive to treatment or severe and persistent requiring pancreatectomy. We have described that more commonly the severe cases of hyperinsulinism associated with beckwith wiedemann syndrome are seen in babies with paternal uniparental isodosomy for 11P. In this baby, there's marked hyperplasia of the pancreatic beta cells. We're going to then talk about the congenital forms of hyperinsulinism. The most common and severe of them is caused by inactivated mutations in the gene encoding the KTP channels of the beta cells. Typically, these babies are born large for gestational age and have severe neonatal hypoglycemia. They require high glucose infusion rates to maintain hypoglycemia. And the hallmark of this form of hyperinsulinism is the fact that they're unresponsive to medical treatments and frequently require surgery. Importantly, in the mid-1990s, it became apparent that there were two histological forms of this 
type of hyperinsulinism, a diffuse form that affects the whole pancreas, and a focal form in which there's only a small lesion in the pancreas that if removed surgically, you can cure the hyperinsulinism. So we're going to talk about this approach to management for these babies. But first, let's talk about the goals of therapy in general. The immediate goals are to promptly restore the plasma glucose to the normal range. The midterm goals are to identify the optimal treatment regimen according to the type of hyperinsulinism, to maintain normal plasma glucose concentrations while encouraging normal feeding and diet. And obviously the long-term goals are to prevent brain damage and to promote normal life and development. It is important when facing a case of persistent hypoglycemia due to hyperinsulinism to have a stepwise approach to the management of these babies. The first step is then to stabilize plasma glucose and prevent further episodes of hypoglycemia. This will require intravenous dextrose followed by an infusion of dextrose. Step two is to confirm the diagnosis and to monitor plasma glucose very closely. Step three then is to determine what support this baby is gonna need to prevent hypoglycemia and to prepare to deliver it. And very frequently this will require central lines because of the high glucose requirement. It's important to allow the baby to continue normal feedings. Feedings should not be used to treat the hypoglycemia because that would result in feeding aversion. So in babies that have very high glucose infusion rates requirement, one can use intravenous glucagon to maintain your glycemia. We use intravenous glucagon as a temporary measure, administered as a one milligram per day continuously. And this effectively, as you can see on the right here, decreases the glucose requirement to maintain your glycemia. One has to be aware of side effects, which include nausea, vomiting, a rare, rash in those that are treated for a prolonged period of time. Now, when we think about the specific treatment for hyperinsulinism, we think that for these babies, you require an individualized treatment plan according to the genotype. So genetic testing results become important according to the phenotype and the clinical manifestations. This obviously requires a comprehensive investigation to understand all aspects of the condition. The, requires to have a, a, a toolbox with different treatment options because one treatment modality may not fit all. So is it this possible for hyperinsulinism? That's exactly what we do for focal hyperinsulinism. And we're working on creating new treatment for the non-focal forms of hyperinsulinism. So then step four is to obtain additional diagnostic data. Step five is to initiate first-line therapy with disoxide. This is the, in the United States, the only approved treatment for hyperinsulinism. We also have to prevent and monitor for side effects of therapies. This would include use of diuretics for those babies treated with disoxide. Step six is then to determine if the disoxide is effective in preventing the hypoglycemia. So once the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism is established, the first step is to initiate a trial of disoxide. One has to be aware of the side effects of disoxide, particularly in the neonatal population, and this includes edema and pulmonary hypertension. So the use of diuretics to prevent edema is extremely important. We determine the responsiveness by doing a safety fast. And in those babies that are responsive, we continue treatment with isoxide for transient cases. This may last two to six months. For permanent cases, the treatment may be required for life. So how do we define disoxide responsiveness? We look at biochemical markers as evidence that the cardinal hallmark of hyperinsulinism, including fasting hypoketotic hypoglycemia, has been reversed with the use of disoxide. This is very important because the lack of response to disoxide suggests that the hyperinsulinism is due to a KTP channel defect. And in this group of babies, one has to consider the possibility of focal hyperinsulinism because we can cure these babies by surgery. And this is about 50% of these cases. So when is surgery indicated in the management of hyperinsulinism? 
Indication for surgeries include suspected focal disease, because surgery is curative for these babies, and for non-focal disease when medical therapy has failed. But before surgery, it's extremely important to distinguish between focal and diffuse disease and to localize this lesion to be able to remove it and cure the hyperinsulinism. So how do we do that? We have learned throughout the years that there is subtle clinical differences that suggest focal versus diffuse hyperinsulinism. For example, babies that have lower birth weight, later presentations, and lower glucose infusion rate requirements are most likely to have focal hyperinsulinism. But the most useful test to determine the likelihood of focal hyperinsulinism is the genetic testing. The finding of a monolelic recessive KTP channel mutation has a 97% sensitivity and a 90% specificity for focal hyperinsulinism. If we know that the mutation was inherited from the father, the positive predicted value for focal hyperinsulinism is 94%. And then we use imaging to localize the lesion. In, in the Children Hospital of Philadelphia Hyperinsulinism Center, we have developed the use of 18 fluorodopa PET scan to localize the lesions. So this radioisotope accumulates in the beta cells and one can then image them using PET scan. This test is not available in many centers in the United States. This um, radioisotope is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration, so it's done on the research uh, protocol. The 18 fluorodopa PET scan in a diffuse case, as you can see in, on the screen, shows diffuse uptake of the radioisotope throughout the pancreas. And in contrast, on the left, you can see a PET scan of a baby with focal hyperinsulinism and a late lesion on the tail of the pancreas. This is another focal case with a lesion on the head of the pancreas, and we use a CT scan to define the precise location of these lesions so the surgeon can go and remove them surgically. That's not the end of the evaluation. During surgery, we do intraoperative evaluation of frozen biopsies by a skilled pathologist to determine if the lesion was found and if the margins are clean. So in the disoxide on responsive cases of hyperinsulinism, genetic analysis then becomes very important to determine the likelihood of focal hyperinsulinism and determine who needs a PET scan. If the genetic testing suggests diffuse disease, then we do not do imaging. We go to intensive medical therapy that includes somatostatin analogs or continuous dextrose through a gastrostomy. If that fails, those babies will require a subtotal pancreatectomy. If the genetic testing suggests backward Wiedemann syndrome or a focal form of hyperinsulinism or is inconclusive, then we do imaging to find the lesions. And if there's a focal lesion, then the lesion is resected surgically. If there is no focal lesion identified, then we move to intensive medical therapy. And if that fails, subtotal pancreatectomy. The outcomes of children with focal or diffuse hyperinsulinism are very different. We can virtually cure all babies with focal hyperinsulinism. The cure rate at our institution is 97%. However, diffuse hyperinsulinism outcomes after surgery are suboptimal to this point. In about 49% of cases, the hypoglycemia persists and additional treatment is required. 31% are sufficiently controlled and 20% will require surgery. Unfortunately, despite all these advances in the management of hyperinsulinism, neurodevelopmental outcomes continue to be suboptimal. In a series of patients that we have treated at CHOP, we determined that 48% of them had some form of neurodevelopmental deficits. This unfortunately does not only include babies with diffuse hyperinsulinism, but also babies with transient hyperinsulinism, as we discuss later. So how are we gonna improve these outcomes? We need to identify and screen infants at risk, 
We need early diagnosis and treatment. We close monitoring of glycemic control and we need better treatment options. And we're working on all these aspects at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Congenital Hyperinsulinism Center. So to conclude, while transitional hypoglycemia is common in normal neonates within the first 24 to 48 hours of life, persistent hypoglycemia beyond this period requires further evaluation. Neonates with persistent hypoglycemia and those at risk for a genetic hypoglycemia disorder should be evaluated for the possibility of an underlying hypoglycemia disorder. And this diagnostic evaluation requires a systematic approach to determine the underlying cause of hypoglycemia because early diagnosis and a specific treatment is important to improve the outcomes. Hyperinsulinism is the most common cause of persistent hypoglycemia in neonates and is associated with high rates of neurodevelopmental deficits. The early diagnosis and appropriate treatment in these babies is important to improve outcomes the treatment of those that are unresponsive to treatment with disoxide requires assessment of the possibility of focal disease. And this requires a specialized center with a multidisciplinary team because this can result in the cure of the hyperinsulinism by integration of genetic testing results and phenotype, imaging with 18 fluorodopa, and expert assessment of the histology. I'll leave you with the reference. Thank you very much for your attention. Please do not hesitate to contact us if we can help you with a patient. On the screen, you can see our email and phone number. And we are here to help you with your patients and uh, collaborate with you. Thank you very much.